All right, let's get the show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1203. Hope you guys are doing okay. And we were in the middle of uh, some definitions last time, so let's just jump right back into that. Um, okay. So we started a new section, uh, 4.2, on max and min values, where we're going to learn about all types of different maximums and minimums. We've already sort of touched on this, but what we touched on is what's called a local maximum or minimum. Uh, we want to generalize that a little bit more and be able to do some things. So if it's f of x is a function, uh, we say it has an absolute maximum if they're on an interval, if there's a point in that interval where the output at that point is bigger than everyone else in that interval, right? Greater than or equal to. Um, it has an absolute minimum if there's a point where the output at that point is less than or equal to everyone else in the interval. Um, we say it's local if those, those two things I just mentioned are true, but only in a small window, not necessarily on the entire interval, but if you open up a small window around uh, that point, then if it's greater than or equal to everyone in that small window, we say we have a local max. And if it's smaller than or equal to everyone in that window, we say it has a local min. Um, yeah, uh, another name for uh, maximum or minimum points are is extreme points. Plural, this is extrema. So if I say something like, oh, find the absolute extrema, I'm really just saying find the absolute maximums and minimums. Okay. And that's where we sort of ended. So now I just want to make this, uh, first of all, a little bit more intuitive, and then talk about some theorems that we're going to be able to use to kind of figure out how to identify uh, these kinds of maximums and minimums. So that's where we are now. We're going to do more on max and min values. And uh, yeah. picking up where we left off. Um, I want to do some illustrations for you guys. Um, Um, for these illustrations, I'm going to be labeling them so you can see what I'm doing. I am going to talk about absolute max as AM. Little AM is absolute min. I'm going to also talk about local max. And lowercase lm is local min. And um, we will identify these. on the graphs below. So just so you sort of understand what I mean. Um, so is that too long? Going to do uh, six examples, I think. And Uh, we are going to be doing it on an interval a, b. Um, so here's a, here's b, here's a, here's b. 
here's A, here's B, here's A, here's B. Okay, so uh, here are the graphs. So one graph uh, starts at A, goes whoop, goes to B, that's one graph. Another graph, um, it starts at A, and then it ends like over B. The proper sounds. And it goes like, and the other one, um, we have, or today goes, and the other one, I was like, uh, this one is um, quite the roller coaster ride. Up, down, up. Down, up, down. Um, and this one. And Okay, so those are the graphs. We're going to identify the absolute maximums and minimums, as well as the local maximums and minimums on this graph. On all of these, um, just so you can kind of see the difference between the two. Um, <clears throat> all right, so. Um, First one, um, any absolute maximums or minimums on this? Yes or no? There's a maximum. Yeah, where is it? Um, on top of the parabola between right. A and B. Right, very top over here. Uh, what kind of maximum? Local. Yeah, uh, but also, it is also absolute, no? What other point on that graph on the interval AB is above that green point? None, right? That is the uh, highest point, right? It's also local. Now it turns out that an absolute max or an absolute min is automatically a local max or local min because if they are um, the biggest guy in the entire interval, then for sure, they're also the biggest guy in their small neighborhood. So the absolute max or min would kind of supersede uh, the local max or min. If, if, if something is both, you kind of call it the absolute version because the local version is actually um, implied. In, in, in fact, I probably should make a note of that before I forget. Note, um, an absolute max or min. A 
is automatically. A local max or min. Um, but not the other way around, of course. So if a point is both an absolute stream point and a local extreme point, we just identify it as an absolute extreme point. Local is implied. Right, so um, absolute is automatically local, but it does not go the other way around. Uh, so that is an absolute max. Any absolute min? Well, there are. Um, the point down here is an absolute min. And the point down here at B is also an absolute min. Zero is the absolute min, right? It's the smallest output on this interval. Um, again, it's also local min. This is also local min. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that graph had both technically, but we would say absolute max or min. What about this one? Um, the highest point achieved is over here. That's the absolute max. Um, of course, it's also local. Because in his neighborhood, he's also the biggest because he's the biggest everywhere. Um, here, we have the absolute min as well, uh, also local. And uh, that's it. There's no one else that would satisfy that requirement. Any other point you pick, you will have points that are both smaller than it and, and, and bigger than it. So nothing else to see here. This graph, we have an absolute min here. Of course, it's also going to be local. Uh, where is the absolute max? Any idea? So turns out there is none. There's no absolute max here. In, in, in fact, uh, for this question, there's also no local max. Um, and the reason is, as we saw last time, we identified absolute max and min based on some x value that we could plug in and determine if it's uh, if the output at that x value is greater than or equal to everything else. It turns out you can't actually pick such an x value in this situation, right? Uh, if someone were to say, "All right, I choose this as my x naught," that would give this point. But oh, there are people bigger than that because if I chose this as my x naught, I can get bigger. And I can choose this as my x naught, and I can get even bigger. And I can choose this as my x naught, and I can get even bigger. And this will happen forever. Um, I can't be at b because the function is undefined at b. It's an asymptote. But I can keep taking x values closer and closer to b and keep getting bigger and bigger. 
Um, and so there is no X value where I can say, okay, the output at this value is the biggest. Um, so yeah, this one has none. Um, similarly, this one has uh, no extrema either. No absolute, uh, nor local. For a similar reason, there's no x value I could pick that would give me the smallest output because the output just keeps going smaller to negative infinity. And there's no output I could pick that would give me the biggest output because the output just keeps going. Um, if we look at this one here, uh, we can start to identify things. The biggest guy is going to be here. That's your absolute max. Um, yes, it's also local. Um, smallest guy on this interval, it's not quite clear, is it? Oh. Let's make this a little bit more clear. Is this guy, obviously, absolute min. He's smaller than or equal to everyone. Um, it's also local. Just automatically. Um, there is no no other. Um, but other than that, uh, we do have some locals. So here is a local max. Here is a local min. Here is a local min. Here is a local max. Here is a local min. Now, what makes it local? Well, if I look at the X value that gave me that guy, if I open a small window around it and just focus my attention to within that window, then that red coordinate is going to be the smallest guy in that little window. In his little world, his little neighborhood, he's the smallest guy around. That's what makes it a local minimum, right? Locally, it's the smallest guy around, but in general, it's not. In general, the smallest guy around is this guy, right? Similarly here, in his neighborhood, he's the biggest guy around. However, in general, there's someone bigger than him, namely that guy, right? So that's the, that's the difference between absolute and local. Uh, this graph has a lot of both of them. Uh, so uh, you can hopefully kind of see the difference between the two, right? So absolute is the biggest guy in general. Um, local is just guys that are the biggest in their little neighborhood. Moving on to the last example, um, clearly there's no absolute, uh, no absolute min. Is there an absolute max? Uh, it turns out no absolute max either. Um, you might be tempted to say this guy is the absolute max, he's the tallest, but uh, there's a hole, that point does not exist. I can approach that point and I can keep getting higher and higher moving up to that point, but I never get to that point, so it can't be an absolute max. Um, right, and obviously with this guy going down to infinity, there's no absolute min, right? It, it keeps getting smaller and smaller. Um, we can have some locals though. Uh, here is a uh, come on, God. here is a local max. Here is a local min. Here is a local min. Um, one thing a student might be tempted to do here is that uh, they might be tempted to call this point that you rise up to meet a local max. However, if you pay attention to the definition, um, you would realize that you can't do that because if I look at that point, open up a small window, and then just focus all my attention in that window, you'll notice that there are points in that window that are higher than that point that's filled in. And so that point that's filled in, this guy is not a local max um, because in his neighborhood, no matter how small you make that neighborhood, there will be points that are bigger than him. Okay. So uh, that's the idea. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more intuition on what these things mean. So absolute is global. 
on the entire interval, who's the biggest, who's the smallest. And local is just means, okay, in this, in a small neighborhood, who's the biggest or the smallest, right? Where are the hills and valleys, right? Whereas the absolutes don't really care about hills and valleys. We just care about who's the biggest, who's the smallest. All right. That being said, let's move on. So as I mentioned here, um, absolute min is automatically a local min. Absolute max is automatically a local max. So uh, the absolute uh, supersedes it. So now, um, we'll now talk about how to identify these guys. Uh, for that, we have some important theorems to know. Um, the first one is called the extreme value theorem. Um, might shorten it EVT. Very important theorem. In fact, there are many math textbooks that take this theorem as an axiom. It's so fundamental, so elementary, so um, seems inescapable that they're just like, you know what, we don't even need a proof for this. Um, there are others that uh, have other axioms and you can prove this. So it's called the theorem, but there are a lot of people who take it as an axiom. Right, it's just, it just is. Um, and it says the following, if f of x is continuous on a closed interval a, b, then f is guaranteed to achieve both its absolute max and absolute min on AB. A continuous function on a closed interval must have global extrema. It's inescapable. Um, there has to be a biggest guy and a smallest guy that can be identified at a specific X value. Um, you might notice that we had situations where we had no absolute max and min. And if you look at those situations, you'll realize that what actually happened was our graph just wasn't continuous on AB. Every situation where we didn't have an absolute max or min, the graph just wasn't continuous, right? Um, there are cases where we could have one and not the other, right? So I could have like uh, A and B, and these are both asymptotes. And then, right, that guy has an absolute max, but no absolute min. Um, but this theorem says you're guaranteed to have to have both of them in a specific situation. If you're continuous on the entire interval AB, you will have both. Every situation where we don't have both is because they weren't continuous. There's an asymptote or a hole or a gap or a jump or something was messing things up. In the event that we are continuous, that will not happen. We can find both. We has to be able to find both. And it's important for you to know that, um, not necessarily as the statement of a theorem, but uh, just because of questions I will ask you to do. So there are times when I ask a question, like I give students a function and an interval, and I say, oh, find the uh, absolute max and min. And there are some students who would give me the answer that, oh, it does not exist, or yeah, I couldn't find one, so it's not there. And I'm like, function is a polynomial. It's definitely there. Polynomial is continuous everywhere. It's definitely continuous on this interval. It's guaranteed to have both. You have to have both, right? So this is saying that, yeah, you have to have both of these features. Um, so that's an important theorem to know. Um, there's another important theorem to know called Fermat's theorem. 
not for Mas last theorem, which some of you might know, uh, the theorem that uh, bothered mathematicians for like 350 years, uh, proven very recently, late 90s, being very recently, um, by a mathematician at Oxford named Andrew Wiles. Um, there was a, a very important theorem, Fermat's last theorem. So uh, we know that, for example, uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared can have integer solutions like 3, 4, 5, or uh, 5, 12, 13, right? We've seen that. Um, uh, can have positive integer solutions. It turns out that that is peculiar to the second power and the first power. It turns out that the theorem says there is a theorem attributed to Fermat. He was an amateur mathematician and he didn't do anything official, didn't write papers and stuff, but he, was, he used to like math. And he wrote in a notebook once, oh, hey, I discovered this really amazing theorem. Um, and I'm not gonna even write down the proof for it because it's so trivial. Anyone can see this is true. Um, <laughs> and what he said was, if you generalize this to the nth power, where n is larger than two, then no integer solutions, no positive integer solutions exist. Right? If you say a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed, can I find three integers where that's true? Three positive integers where that's true? You can't. You can't, you just can't, right? A to the fourth plus B to the fourth equals C to the fourth. Can I find three positive integers where that's true? You can't, it's impossible, right? That was Fermat's last theorem. Very elementary um, because it's just a generalization of Pythagoras' theorem, which is so elementary. You can find websites that have over a hundred proofs of, of Pythagoras' theorem. Pythagoras' theorem, very elementary. We know how to prove it all sorts of ways. Um, once you change the power from two to something higher though, it now becomes impossible. And it actually took mathematicians like 300 plus years to actually prove that in general, which um, by the way, I'm just gonna show you that I put it back. If you uh, want an interesting read, um, this is one of my favorite books that's not a math textbook. <laughs> um, so this kind of tells the uh, story of Fermat's last theorem. And it's right there. That guy, no solution. Um, and it's, it's one of those popular math books. You don't have to be a math person to understand it, but it's, it just tells you the story of, you know, what happened, what are the developments over the centuries of this coming up. But it, it was, it's very well written. It's written, I think from the perspective of a guy who was researching this and he's taught interviewing people and they're telling him all these stories that used to happen. And um, yeah, eventually he gets to the story of Andrew Wiles. Um, and what he had to go through to prove it. And it was a, a very interesting, at least to me, I don't know. Vermont's Enigma is the book by Simon Singh. Okay. So uh, that's not the theorem we're talking about, but I thought I would just mention it because uh, when, you, when a lot of people hear Fermat's theorem, uh, that's what they think about because that's the, that's the most famous theorem of Fermat or Fermat. Sometimes they, the T is silent. Okay, we're going to do a different theorem, which is actually easy to prove. I'm not gonna prove it for you, um, but when I teach my 1206 class, I prove it for them. It's really not that difficult to prove, but here's what that guy says. Um, suppose f of x attains a local max or local min um, at x equals x naught 
And suppose f prime at x naught exists, right? So we know a max or a min has occurred and we know that the derivative exists, right? For whatever reason, we know that the derivative limit will give us a number. Um, then it turns out the derivative must be a specific value, namely zero. So if you're at a max or a min and you know the derivative exists, the answer must be zero. Um, so there's something that is worth mentioning here um, because uh, one of the reasons why uh, math is difficult for a lot of people is because the language is not interpreted uh, the same way that your regular English languages. And so people get mixed up by that, which is why it's important for you to talk in class so I can see if your language is matching up with how you should be thinking about things. Um, Okay, I'm just checking the screen. I think it was freezing a little bit. Um, but I want you to note, a lot of people would think of it as the other way around when a math statement would have made it very clear that it works the other way around. I want you to note that the, the converse is not true. Meaning, if you knew the last statement, it does not imply the first statement, um, i.e., if f prime at x naught equals zero, it does not mean that there's a max or a min there. So if I know there's a max or min and the derivative exists, the derivative must be zero. But knowing the derivative is zero does not mean there has to be a max or min. In fact, I can give you a very simple example. Look at f of x equals x cubed. Um, then your f prime of x would be 3x squared. And f prime at zero is zero, right? So is this a max or min? Um, but now you look at this and you're like, well, I know what the graph of x cubed looks like. Because we all should at this point. Looks like that. And then you realize there's no max or min at zero. Right? That's zeros right there. That's not a max or min. Um, so. Yeah, the derivative being zero does not mean you have a max or a min. It's the other way around that's, uh, that works. If you know there's a max or a min already and the derivative is, exists, then the derivative must be zero. Um, so the derivative being zero doesn't, uh, doesn't actually imply the other way around. Um, there's another thing to note. Um, we may have extrema when the derivative does not exist. Um, and there's an example that we've seen uh, over and over at this point. Remember this guy, f of x equals the absolute value of x. Um, so this has a min here. Uh, this has an absolute min. Um, um, in fact, also local min. Um, but f prime of zero does not exist for the absolute value of x. We've proven that over and over, actually. Okay, 
So it's possible to attain an extrema when the derivative does not exist. So Fermat's theorem tells you that if the derivative exists and you know there's a max or a min, um, then uh, the derivative must be zero. The converse is not true though, um, but the converse is what would be important in identifying them. So uh, how does Fermat's theorem help us? So however, is useful indirectly. Um, in the sense that, in the sense that it indicates at which points we need to look to find the max or min, indicates at which points we need to look or extrema. Um, namely, uh, as they will potentially be there, not guaranteed. Uh, and namely, this leads to the notion of what we call critical points. And that's a phrase that I've used before, but I didn't uh, explain where it came from. Um, and so this is why uh, critical points were defined the way it was defined before. and. Um, it's because of Fermat's theorem definition. Uh, we say X is a critical number of F of X if um, F prime of X equals zero or F prime of X is undefined, does not exist, okay? So the places where derivatives are zero or undefined, these are prime candidate locations for where a max or min might occur. And so we want a definition that uh, encompasses that. Um, so that's a critical number definition. If X is a critical number, then the point x comma f of x is called a critical point. Okay. Um, I want you to note in practice, Uh, we often use critical points to describe both critical numbers and critical points. I'll technically incorrect. This is understood in context. So even in the past, uh, when we find an X value where the derivative is zero undefined, uh, we tend to say, oh, that's a critical point. But that's not the critical point. Technically, it's the critical number. When I plug that in and get the corresponding output and find the coordinate, that's the critical point. But sometimes people just call it X critical point. The input X is the critical number. Um, so now let's talk about finding extrema. So 
So how do we find them? Uh, if local, we actually know how to do that already. Use the first derivative test. Notice that that involved finding critical points and then testing the interval on uh, both sides. Um, or I guess you could say second derivative test as well, but we didn't cover that. So uh, we actually know how to find the locals already. We've been doing it actually. Um, however, if absolute, what you're going to do is you're going to use something called the closed interval method. Okay. Um, let me describe what that is, the closed. Closed interval method. Uh, and it's called the closed interval method because we're going to always apply it on closed intervals. <laughs> okay, so, uh, Suppose f is continuous on a closed interval. And differentiable. Not, not necessarily differentiable. Continuous on a closed interval. A, B. Uh, we can find its global extrema by the way these are guaranteed to exist let me by the extreme value theorem Right. So if I ask a question like this in class and you tell me, oh, it doesn't exist, what are you talking about? Um, so this is, we can find this global extrema by um, this following process. One, find all critical points or critical numbers, I should say, and evaluate F at these points. At these numbers. You will obtain corresponding Y equals F of X values. That's the first thing, find all the critical points. And uh, you don't have to test them on a number line, just plug in, plug them into the function. Uh, two, you're going to evaluate F at the endpoints. I.e., you are going to find what is F of A and F of B. You're going to plug in the endpoints of the interval into the function. And three, uh, you're going to compare. And the smallest one. Is your absolute max and the smallest 
think this can be plural as well. The smallest is your absolute min. Um, and these are stated as equations showing the coordinate. Um, I.e., uh, we would say, for example, f at this point equals that output is uh, the absolute max. So suppose uh, x equals 1 is a critical number, the output is 5, and that is the biggest on the interval. You would say f of 1 equals 5 is the absolute max. Right, you make that statement. Okay. Um, try this for next time. My writing is all over the place today. Example, um, suppose f of x equals uh, x to the fourth minus 4x squared. Find the absolute extrema of f on the interval minus 1 to 3. Okay, so you're going to find that. Um, and that's the closed interval method. The idea behind the closed interval method is that, as you can see in some of the previous examples, like this example, for example, um, an absolute extrema can occur at the endpoints. It can, in fact, occur at A, um, right? Uh, so I'd also hear absolute min at A, absolute max at B. Right, so it's possible for this guy to be an endpoint or occur at an endpoint. So that's why the second step is necessary. Um, and so you're going to use this to find the absolute max and min of that function, which, by the way, is guaranteed to exist. Um, and we can uh, stop there, I think. Yeah, the next big topic we're going to move on to is uh, curve sketching. But for that, before that, I need to talk to you about asymptotes as some sort of prerequisite. Um, but yeah, that's where we're going. All right, so that's it. Uh, have a good weekend. Enjoy the rest of your Friday, and we'll stop right there. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Ciao.